पार <coughs> ओम अज्ञान चिरंद ज्ञानजना सदाकया चक्षुर्मिता जैन तस्म श्रीगुरव नम श्रीचैतन्य मनोपीस्तमस्थित जैन भुक्त स्वयं रूपा कदा मह्यम ददाते स्वापदे हम श्रीगुर श्रीजुतापदकमल श्रीगुर वैष्णव श्रीरूप सा व्रजात सहगन रघुनता सजीव साइत साधुत परीजन सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य श्रीराधा कृष्ण पद सहगना ललित श्री विशका हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधो दीना बंधो जगत्पथे गोपीशा गोपिका कंत राधा कंत नमोस्त थे तब तक कंसन गौरांगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी ऋषभानु स्थिति देवी प्राणमा हरे प्रिय वंशकल्प तिव्य कृपा सिंधु पति पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम नारायण नमस्कृत नरम शरोतम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथा मुदीर Before reciting this Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our very means of conquest, let us first offer our respectful obeisances unto Narayana, the supreme personality of Godhead, unto Nara Narayana Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and unto Sri La Vyasa Dev, the author. Nasta Praya Shabad Dreeshu. भागवत भागवत उत्तम श्लोके भक्तिर्भवती नैष्टि बाय रेग्युलरली हियरिंग द श्रीमद भागवतम एंड बाय रेंडरिंग सर्विस ऑन टू द प्योर डिवोटी All that is troublesome within the heart becomes destroyed practically to nil, and loving devotional service unto the supreme Lord, who is praised with transcendental songs, becomes established as an irrevocable fact. Idam Bhagavata Manama, Puranam Brahma Samitam. उत्तम श्लोक चरित चकार भगवन्षि निश्रेयसा लोक से धन्य स्वशयन महत श्रीमद्भागवत नोन एज दि ग्रंथ राज द किंग ऑफ ऑल वेरिक लिटरेचर्स is the literary incarnation of god it is compiled by the incarnation of god sri lavyasadev it is meant for the ultimate good of all people it is all successful all blissful and all perfect sri krishna chaitanya sri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda prabhu nityananda sri advaita gradhar श्रीवासरी गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे
request everyone to kindly fold your hands and repeat the following two mantras after me. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Sri Surabhyay Namaha Om Sri Surabhyay Namaha Om Sri Surabhyay Namaha Mukham Karoti Vasalam Pangum Langayate Grim Yat Kripat Maham Bande Sri Gurum Dinatadanam Yat Kripat Maham Bande Sri Gurum Dinatadanam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Is that another hall in the back? Anyways So Hare Krishna welcome to everyone Um, I think there was a little change in your schedule today Evening, normally you have Sunday feast earlier. Morning, okay, yeah. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I'm very happy to get this opportunity to visit your temple. It's been quite some time. Um, actually, I don't come to Bangalore so often, so today was a little bit of a marathon. We left at 7.30 in the morning from quite, I forget, the area we came from, but uh, we started by visiting uh, our three main temples here in uh, Bangalore. I have a particular theme that I would like to share with you. You know, our ISKCON society, by the mercy of our founder, Acharya Srila Prabhupada, has given all of us innumerable opportunities, unlimited opportunities actually, to engage in different ways in devotional service and to engage in helping our previous acharyas and in particular in helping Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, introduce and spread this most important mission of the Sankirtan movement. India in many ways, I mean, since time immemorial, immemorial has been the land of dharma. And so many people over the centuries from different countries actually would come, would travel. In those days, without the facilities that we have now for traveling. So a great... uh, cost and labor and uh, time consuming also would travel to India actually to receive this knowledge, this treasure house of knowledge, of Vedic knowledge actually, which we are finding out more and more, uh, Sanskrit for, for example being the mother uh, <clears throat> language of all the other languages, India has over the centuries uh, amazingly enough although within this period of Kali Yuga, having been conquered uh, by so many foreign uh, agencies or elements over the centuries, still India remained and remains today a great source of uh, knowledge and inspiration. We see now, for example, 
and of course to a large extent. This is very much to the credit of our founder Acharya. Uh, interest in yoga, interest in kirtan, interest in uh, <clears throat> vegetarianism, etc., is uh, very much increasing all over the world. And of course, Srila Prabhupada's desire and the desire of our previous Acharyas is to actually uh, give to the world something that the world has lost uh, since many centuries. And we know, of course, from our Shastra that although this is Kali Yuga, uh, it's a special Kali Yuga. I'll just relate a, a short story I, I heard recently, which I was mentioning just a few days ago. 5,000 years ago, those who were <clears throat> especially living in, in the Himalayas, the sadhus, because historically, as you all know, uh, that's sadhus, they just want to especially concentrate on spiritual development, emancipation. And uh, we know that many sadhus, they only come down from the Himalayas uh, when there's a Kumbh Mela. <laughs> Otherwise, they stay up there. So 5,000 years ago, because sadhus are totally absorbed always uh, <clears throat> in uh, meditating and uh, studying also the Shastra, they, they could understand that actually Kali Yuga is about to begin. And of course, the greatest of all sadhus uh, at that time, uh, Srila Vyasadeva, uh, who is still actually in the Himalayas, living there, <clears throat> he was also uh, <clears throat> understanding uh, that very soon Kali Yuga will begin. So some sadhus actually uh, <clears throat> were very concerned because Kali Yuga means a lot of problems and difficulties and suffering for the people of this age. So they decided to go to the ashram of Srila Vyasadeva to consult with him <clears throat> what to do <clears throat> in preparation of this Kali Yuga. As they were approaching the ashram of Srila Vyasadeva with their concern, as they approached, they could hear him chanting mantras, which sadhus do all the time. <laughs> but as they approached, one of the mantras he was chanting was, all glories to Kali Yuga, all glories to Kali Yuga, all, all glories to Kali Yuga. And they were very puzzled. <laughs> uh, here they were coming with their concern, and, 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 and Sri Vyasadev was glorifying Kali Yuga. So anyways, they approached him very humbly, and they requested him, why you're, why you're glorifying Kali Yuga? Then he went on to explain that actually, generally, Kali Yuga is a very difficult, the, the, the most difficult of periods, and <clears throat> therefore people, people uh, suffer tremendously as well. But this Kali Yuga, which is about to begin, is a very unique and special Kali Yuga, because in this Kali Yuga, <clears throat> a very great personality will appear to introduce the remedy that will neutralize the effect of Kali Yuga. And then, of course, that is inserted in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam, very well known verse by most devotees, Kalera Doshalide Rajan, Asti Hyeka Mahanguna, Kirtana Deva Krishna Sya, Mukta Sangha Param Brajat. That although the sage of Kali is a most <clears throat> difficult period, uh, it is like a notion of miseries and problems and faults. I think we can all attest to that every single day, so many challenges and problems. But in this age of Kali, there is this Mahaguna, great quality, great opportunity 
Kirtanadeva Krishnasya, Krishna Kirtan, Hari Kirtan, simply by taking shelter of the holy name. We cannot fathom our great fortune to have taken birth in this particular historical period, uh, just at the beginning of this uh, 10,000 year, <clears throat> 10,000 years, which began actually with the advent of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Now, of course, some people say, well, you know, <clears throat> where is the golden age? <laughs> It's predicted that the golden age will begin with the advent of Lord Chaitanya, but where is the golden age? <clears throat> the golden age actually has begun. It began with the advent of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Of course, soon after the disappearance of Lord Chaitanya, for reasons that are not so easy to understand, the whole mission of Lord Chaitanya kind of like disappeared or at least, at least became... Uh, misdirected, interrupted, and for about two, three hundred years, actually, until the advent of a great personality by the name of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Uh, only by his uh, presence and contribution was this mission of the Lord again revived, isn't it? So then after some period of time, of course, it has continued through his sons, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, and more recently has taken on this uh, <clears throat> very uh, much greater dimension in terms of introducing this knowledge, introducing this culture, Vedic culture, outside of India, something that was very much uh, <clears throat> desired and, and, and meditated upon by the previous Acharyas, but no one could uh, <clears throat> understand how this would be done. And of course, great prediction, prediction is there. More sena pati bhakta. My great uh, general, uh, commander general, will soon appear. This is there in the Shastra. And of course, that great commander is His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So at different times, there are deviations or there are, uh, you know, society becomes misdirected. This evening, I just want to uh, focus on an area which we often don't think about or at least we don't think about sufficiently. And uh, it is connected with a major deviation that has taken place in general society uh, which is actually the cause in many ways for the kind of very severe degradation that we see all over the world and that has uh, increased especially in the last century. Uh, and this is connected. Shri Prabhupada speaks about this on a number of occasions. This is connected with the era of uh, industrialization or the industrial revolution. We forget, actually, you know, when we look at our recent history, especially here in India, we point the finger to the British. These guys, you know, <laughs> they're the cause of so many. And of course, uh, historically, <clears throat> there is uh, truth. But actually, we should keep in mind that the, the British, uh, it was around that time that it was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and of course, the whole Western influence and mentality was very much introduced here in India. And uh, <clears throat> we find ourselves, not only here in India, but actually all over the world, in a situation where <clears throat> our basic traditional values are, are basic traditional uh, lifestyle, our basic traditional occupation <clears throat> has uh, changed tremendously and is threatening, uh, especially here in India, but not only in India. We have here in India, 
a ministry that is trying to address this particular area, which is uh, <clears throat> not easy actually to to address because it's 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 it's, it's complicated. Uh, <clears throat> I'm talking about a major deviation that is ongoing today, which we may be less aware of. A major deviation in terms of. <clears throat> the trend towards increased urbanization. And of course, the trend towards increased uh, materialistic way of life. Vedic culture, uh, <clears throat> we should try to understand from uh, the more recent history, let's say going back to 5,000 years, when the Lord descended on this planet and manifested his pastimes in Vrindavan. Sri Prabhupada explains that actually the primary reason for the Lord's descent in Vrindavan was to show us that this village life, village life in Vrindavan, as lived by Krishna and Balaram and the residents of Vrindavan, is meant to be the model and the standard, not only for people at that time, <laughs> but actually is meant to be the standard and the model for people all the time. Sanatan Dharma. Sanatan Dharma is based on eternal scientific concepts and principles. Eternal means it should not change. When we change, when, when we change anything in connection with dharma, and dharma, of course, something that Prabhupada spoke about, that is there in Shastra. Again, something we do not sufficiently understand. Dharma is not only in terms of our spiritual activities. Dharmam to Sakshat Bhagavat Pranitam. The Lord Himself creates Dharma. And Dharma needs to be understood, and when it is properly understood, needs to be practiced, practiced and demonstrated on two levels. There is what is called spiritual Swadharma. Spiritual Swadharma has to do with the nature identity and activities of the spirit soul. And that is nicely summarized, of course, by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Jivera Swarup Hoy Krishna Nityadas. As Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita. Mamai Vangsho Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. We are the eternal parts and parcels of Krishna. And our position, our constitutional position, Krishna Bhakti Nitya Siddha. Uh, Krishna Bhakti Nitya Siddha, our eternal quality or nature is Krishna Bhakti. So this is on the level of spiritual Swadharma, which of course, unfortunately, is practically speaking unknown in modern day society and that's one of the major dimensions or aspects that we as a society are endeavoring to introduce, that is what all of our previous acharyas have been preaching. The other dimension, which is also extremely important because it also constitutes a science in itself, and that is called material swadharma. Material swadharma has to do with how we relate and interact with the material nature. Material Swadharma has to do with our ability to understand how we should live collectively or how, how society should be organized. And of course, in as much as spiritual Swadharma is a science, the science of Bhakti, the science of uh, Atma Gyan or Atma Tattva, 
materials for dharma is also a science. And that science actually is called Varnasrama Dharma. And in as much as Krishna Bhakti or spiritual Svadharma is an eternal science, Varnasra Dharma is also an eternal science. I'll share with you a few things which will demonstrate that when leaders in society, and there are different kinds of leaders, three major uh, divisions of leadership within society, but when any of these levels of leadership are not uh, properly executing their duties and responsibilities, then naturally both the spiritual dimension of dharma as well as the material dimension of, of dharma uh, becomes uh, misdirected or misused and all kinds of irregularities. This is what we have actually in modern day society. This ministry I was mentioning possibly a little earlier, we have a ministry in India that was established 10 years ago called the Iskan Daiva Varnasra Ministry. The primary goal and purpose of this ministry is actually uh, promote what we call rural development. Go to the villages, understand how essential are our villages. Our villages here in India at present are under tremendous pressure. They are being threatened of their very existence, actually. Because villages, traditionally, uh, especially if we go back 5,000 years ago, but we don't have to go back that far, even a few hundred years ago. What is the special feature in villages? Two main activities, actually. Krishi and Goraksha, isn't it? So if we understand that actually general society is meant, uh, or Vedic society, general society means actually it should be based on the Vedic principles, uh, Vedic culture, because that's an eternal culture which addresses both the spiritual as well as the material dimension of life. <clears throat> so, Varnasrama culture or Vedic culture, Prabhupada would uh, <clears throat> equate them sometimes, is based on this science of Krishi Guraksha. Krishi Guraksha Vani Jam Vaisha Karma Swabhava Jam. This is the uh, perfect definition and the perfect formula for a sustainable economy. In the Vedic uh, literatures, we find four basic sciences described. I'm just referring to the fourth one, science of economics. How many grihastas are here, householders? So you should all be interested in economics, no? <laughs> By nature. But most of us, and definitely, practically speaking, all the leaders of different countries around the world, they don't know this formula. They don't know this science. Because actually it is a science. Everything about Krishna consciousness, both on the spiritual level as well as the material level, is a science. Let me try and give you a few examples. Uh, actually, in, in our ISKCON society, we especially concentrate on the spiritual dimension. You know, uh, Bhagavat Dharma, which is the most important, but we tend to actually minimize or even neglect or generally are much less aware of the other dimension which is actually not good because it creates an imbalance. It's just like, you know, our body is material 
And we're sitting here because there's a soul in the body. If our soul, if our, the soul would not be there, we could not be sitting here because the body would be dead. <laughs> so we take care of this body, isn't it? So in other words, uh, <clears throat> dharma means to find and create and maintain this kind of balance between matter and spirit, between the material body and, and the spiritual body, the spiritual self. And that is what our uh, Srimad Bhagavatam is teaching us, for example. Uh, uh, this very well-known verse, Savai Pum Sam Paro Dharmo, Jato Bhakti Radhokshaji, Ahai Tukiya Prakti Hata Yagatma Suprasidati. Atma, Atma, as Prabhupada explains, is not only the soul. Atma means either the body, the mind, or the soul. So I was mentioning about this uh, major deviation. I see major deviation on three fronts has taken place in the last 300 years, especially. Before that, uh, Kali Yuga was, of course, uh, active, but it took on a more uh, severe kind of uh, <clears throat> position with the neglect of three areas which are actually very essential for society to function properly. <clears throat> this is also connected with uh, something that happened as well in Europe, I mean in France. The Industrial Revolution was started in England. Before that, or around the same time, what we call the French Revolution. The French and the English. <laughs> the French Revolution also <clears throat> actually uh, was the beginning point of rejection of religion because the French Revolution was based on rejection, uh, rejecting the uh, spiritual authorities of the time who were actually not properly representing uh, religion and also a rejection of the monarchs or the kings at that time, anyone who studied a little bit of history. So when we reject religion, basically what we do is we minimize or reject uh, the Brahminical culture, isn't it? Because Brahmanas primarily are meant to uphold. Uh, they, they, they learn, they study, and they teach dharma. Uh, and they live accordingly as well. So, <clears throat> the second thing, yeah, rejection of leadership, rejection of authority, because authority was, uh, people, kings, leaders, were misusing their positions of authority. Of course, that's ongoing today as well. <clears throat> so, first the brahmanas, then the kshatriyas. And then with this industrial revolution, the vaishyas. Primary activity of vices, as we know, of course, is agriculture, production of food. And now we have around the world uh, a tremendous crisis. I see not only one crisis. We, we are faced with many crises at the same time. And these crises are actually threatening all of us uh, on different levels. <clears throat> and why, why is it that we as devotees should be aware of this and concerned about this? It's because, for example, in terms of uh, <clears throat> material nature, if we look in the sector of agriculture, because of uh, mechanization and in industrialization we have introduced, as we all know, what we call uh, modern agriculture, using tractors. And then we've introduced, of course, calling it the Green Revolution, all kinds of uh, chemical fertilizers, chemical pesticides. And now after 75 years or so, there are... Uh, <clears throat> 
findings that have been coming out more and more, which is now making it obvious that in over 80 countries around the world, the land in 80 countries around the world is unable to produce the quality food needed as well as the quantity needed for an increased population. The topsoil here in India, this is, you can research it or, or, or Google it, as they say. The topsoil in India in the last 100 years has lost practically 95% of its natural nutrients. We have a global problem which is called desertification. More and more land is becoming desert-like, means unable to produce food. And the kind of food we are producing, we are growing, is actually contaminated by all of the unnatural uh, elements that we're putting. And also by this unnatural method of doing agriculture. I'm just taking this one particular example because it's close to our ministry since we are going in the villages and we are talking with leaders in the villages and we are getting, we could say, first-hand information and observation as well. You know, In many of our villages in India, practically, there are no cows left. In some villages, they have like 300 tractors. In some villages, there are no young people to take up, actually, farming. In many of our villages here in India, there's, there's a severe water problem. Even bore wells cannot go after a thousand feet, can't get water. <clears throat> so the material energy, and this actually, uh, I should mention this point because this is directly connected with our Shastra. Uh, in the Mahabharata, we know that one of our great authorities, uh, we're fortunate to have, you know, these Mahajans, we have 14 authorities. Uh, one of them is Bhishma Dev, Grandfather Bhishma Dev. And he explains actually in his uh, <clears throat> giving instruction to Yudhishthira Maharaj when Grandfather Bhishma Dev is on his bed of arrows, uh, waiting for that opportune time to leave his body. He explains how the Lord has given to humanity three natural gifts. By uh, properly utilizing these three natural gifts, society will prosper. People will be happy, they will be healthy, they will live for many years, and they will be prosperous. But if any of these are neglected or obstructed or abused or exploited, then this will begin the downfall of society and will actually uh, bring in its destruction. And it's very important for all of us because these three gifts of nature are directly connected with what I just mentioned a few minutes ago in terms of what the French Revolution and Industrial Revolution has done. It has gone, uh, we could say, in many ways against or, or triggered a scenario whereby these three gifts of nature are pra practically speaking destroyed today. The first gift of nature, and you'll understand immediately, the first gift of nature that Bish Grandfather Bhishma Dev speaks about is the gift of mother cow. Because mother cow, <clears throat> by nature, is meant to sustain the entire universe, to sustain not only human beings, but actually all other forms of life. <clears throat> Actually, without cows, <clears throat> there cannot be proper agriculture. Without cows, actually, there cannot be proper anything. 
actually, when we stop and analyze. <clears throat> but I'll connect the second gift of nature and you'll immediately understand. <clears throat> Grandfather Vishpandeva explains the second gift of, of nature is land, Mother Bhumi, Mother Nature. And there is a natural symbiosis between cows and the lamb. They are meant to uh, uh, mutually help one another. The land naturally nourishes the cows by the grass. And the cows and the bulls, huh, by their walking, by their grazing on the land, which they are meant to do actually pretty well all day. <laughs> They should not be tied up in a goshala. It's a wrong conception, you know, a misconception in terms of cow protection. Real cow protection is having the cows out and having their calves with them also 12 hours a day. This whole science, of course, in itself. So cows are the most important element or living entity to actually help the soil become and maintain its fertility. Because by their uh, hooves, by walking on the land, they actually massage Mother Bhumi. <laughs> and they, they, they break up the topsoil. And by their uh, natural you know, uh, falling of dung and urine, all kinds of living entities in the soil, they come up. In order to come up, they have to make little holes, isn't it? So they make hundreds and thousands, if not billions of holes, to get this cow dung, and they bring it down. And, and this nourishes the soil. And by making these little tunnels, when it rains, the rain goes into the tunnels and further nourishes the soil. This is Krishna's magic. <laughs> this is Krishna's science of how the soil is meant to be. You know, we read descriptions in Vrindavan how <clears throat> the cows were so happy and so healthy and so fatty. Their milk bath, the, the milk was just dripping. You didn't have to milk the cows. The, the, the milk was automatically coming. <clears throat> so this is how na Krishna's nature is such that Krishna has arranged that, there are many reasons actually, Krishna has arranged that every single individual, every single family should be maintaining cows. That's how it was just recently. Many of you who are a little elderly or who have a grandmother and grandfather, they'll tell you. In our village, everyone had not only one cow, but many cows. <laughs> and our village had thousands of cows, isn't it? <clears throat> Our Vedic culture, as we know, is primarily, uh, you know, the whole network in terms of social uh, organization and how we live and how we work is meant to gradually bring all of us at least to the mode of goodness. And because cows are already in the mode of goodness, just see Krishna's wonderful arrangement. We are meant to live with cows. We are meant to serve cows. We are meant to utilize their cow dung as we were doing just a few years back by smearing our floor and, and, and outside building, etc. Simply by associating with cows, even without any extra endeavor on our part, we develop gradually the mode of goodness. This is Krishna's plan, wonderful plan, isn't it? So traditionally, even now in many villages, in front of the house, there's a Tulsi plant, uh, and there are cows. So I'm just saying that actually there has been a plan by personalities who are, as described in the Bhagavad Gita, basically there's two kinds of people in the world, the divine and the demoniac, isn't it? Uh, Krishna described the, the Sura and the, and the Deva, the, the Asura, rather. Uh, so, when one is devoid of knowledge 
of transcendental knowledge, when one doesn't know about Bhagavad Gita or spirituality, uh, which is the case for the vast majority of our leaders today, that, therefore they enact all kinds of policies which actually are going against the established order. Huh? So when we go against the laws of the government, then uh, we become criminal and we become arrested and we are punished. So the very same thing happens, is happening now, actually. We are going in a very major way against the established law of nature. And therefore, we are on the verge, actually, it is so critical now, we are on the verge of destroying the very planet in which we are living. Many of us, I mean, I only found out about some of these things recently because in, in this uh, outreach program that we have in our ministry of going out in the villages, understanding about how the soil has been uh, misused and how uh, <clears throat> the whole food production is also becoming balanced, etc. We, we come in contact with nature. We start thinking a bit more about its importance. We, we start understanding how when we abuse things that are close to Krishna or living entities close to Krishna, dear to Krishna. Krishna is not happy. The cows are extremely dear to the Lord. It is Krishna's nature as well. We have a moral, if not also a spiritual duty and responsibility to care for Mother Nature and to be concerned when she is abused and neglected and exploited, as she is today. And that is one of many reasons why our founder, Charya Srila Prabhupada, warned us about the dangers of urbanization. There is, There has been, for the last 30 years, a very systematic plan, actually, to move more and more people out of villages in the urban sector. And the prediction is that within a few years, 50% of the population in the world will be living in cities. <clears throat> and will not be having proper food to eat, will not be having proper air to breathe. And this will be affecting not only our body, our health, our mind, but also our ability even to chant Hare Krishna, our ability to practice spirituality. So therefore, Prabhupada wanted that we establish self-sufficient communities. Villages are self-sufficient communities. So this, this is very important to understand. Prabhupada spoke about, actually before leaving, that actually 50% of my mission is yet to be established. 50% if you're a businessman, you'll understand that that's quite a bit. <laughs> you know, 50% of anything is quite substantial. So all of us actually are duty-bound. It's, it's right there in practically every other page of the Bhagavatam. <clears throat> what is meant to be the practical application of dharma. Dharma, again, is not simply chanting the holy name. Of course, the basis of dharma is the chanting of the holy name in this Kali Yuga. But if we properly, nicely chant the holy name, we will be able to understand more, more clearly and more deeply what is the mission of our acharyas, what are the instructions given to us by Srila Prabhupada. <clears throat> we, around the world, we have actually allowed for so many uh, malpractices to take place. Both, again, on the spiritual level as well as the spiritual level. Is that the clock? Okay. Clocks always tick away. They don't stop. <laughs> Actually, it's a very... Uh, it's a very big topic, and it's not an easy topic also 
initially to, to, uh, to understand. And especially one may think, well, you know, what do all these things have to do with us as devotees? We're preachers. We want to spread, spread the holy name. Uh, we want to establish temples. Just a few small things I want to share because I don't want to prolong this uh, too, too long. You know, before Srila Prabhupada went to America, we know that he was already, you know, from 1944, he started writing his Back to Godhead magazine. And even before that, you know, I mean, Prabhupada from birth, one time a reporter asked Prabhupada, because, you know, we always ask somebody, when did you become Krishna conscious? When did so A reporter asked Prabhupada, when did you become Krishna conscious? <laughs> you know. So Prabhupada, of course, had always the right answer for any kind of question. So he, Prabhupada rightly replied, I do not remember a time when I ever forgot Krishna. I think the reporter did not ask any more questions. <laughs> So, Srila Prabhupada from, was born in the Vaishnava family. He mentions in some purports, you know, I had the great fortune of being born in the Vaishnava family. So even before going to America, Srila Prabhupada, <clears throat> of course, especially after meeting his Guru Maharaj when he was a young man, who gave him that order to preach Krishna consciousness. Naturally, after receiving this order, Prabhupada started contemplating more, and even as a grihastha, started uh, associating with uh, members of the Gaudiya Math, etc., and became initiated, as we all know. But there's a very important uh, article written in the Back to Godhead magazine of 1956 called Essay on Gita Nagari. How many of you here have heard of the Essay Gita Nagari? I can count on one hand, maybe two maximum. <laughs> yeah, not so many. Uh, this Essay on Gita Nagari the, uh, I would say, essence of the essay on Gita Nagari, we can find in a letter written by Srila Prabhupada to one Dr. Patel in 1949. We're going back, 1949. Prabhupada in 1949, the same thing he repeated in this article in 1956, speaks about four movements. Four movements, before establishing the Hare Krishna movement, Prabhupada had in mind four movements. And I just very briefly want to share with you because to me when I came in contact with this, which was, I don't know, some 20 years ago, <laughs> to me it was a revelation. Because I had not, it's not immediately obvious. So in that essay on Gita Nagari, Prabhupada, and I'll use the exact same words that Prabhupada uses. The first movement he calls the Sankirtan movement, referring to the holy name and an extension of the holy name that he calls the Brihat Mradanga, transcendental literatures, right? So the holy name in books is what Prabhupada means in, in, in that context, Sankirtan movement. Second movement, Prabhupada calls it the uh, <clears throat> deity worship movement. Deity worship movement means establishing temples as we have here and in so many places around the world by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada where there are installed deities where people who have received the holy name can come to some place and no more. <laughs> Isn't it? The third movement Prabhupada called it, calls it spiritual initiation movement. So when people receive the holy name or receive a book, come to know a little bit, they come to a temple, to Sunday feast, then they, they start associating with devotees. Spiritual initiation means what we have today in our ISKCON society, congregational preaching. We cultivate people. We 
explain to them that actually the human form of life is very rare, very special, and you should take it seriously and you should become qualified to become an official member of Krishna's family by taking initiation, isn't it? That's the third movement. The fourth movement, the name that Prabhupada gave it, might confuse one initially. Prabhupada calls the fourth movement classless society movement. <laughs> classless society. And then, you know, many people say, wonderful, we don't need any classes. <laughs> right. So Prabhupada, when he uh, explains, classless society means four varnas and four asramas where each member of each varna and each member of each asrama is simply fixed on the same activity of serving Krishna. That's classless society. And therefore, it means, that's why our acharyas began calling Varnasrama as Daiva Varnasrama. Daiva Varnasrama is that social system, that very scientific, God created, Krishna created social system, that eternal system is right there in the Bhagavad Gita, isn't it? Krishna says, I created this system. And it's an eternal system <clears throat> where everyone is understanding that, okay, Prabhupada actually used to use, uh, use this example. We should look at or see Varnasram as like a drama. You know? Any, any one of you who has uh, acted in some drama, you had a particular role to play. But even when you're on the stage, you know you're just playing that role. You're not really the king or whatever. You're just playing the role for the few minutes that you're on the stage. So in a similar way, we are simply playing the role of a Brahmana, of a Kshatriya, of a Vaishya Shudra, even as Vaishnavas. This is the uh, system, uh, social system, that is meant to help. Actually, Prabhupada makes this following point, which is also made by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, that Varnasrama is that social arrangement, even though it is material, which will facilitate and help us to become Vaishnavas. You see. <clears throat> so, um, I just want to end on a few small things. Yes, it's drawing everyone's attention here. <laughs> well, maybe saying that this is, yeah. So, we mentioned about Bhishma Dev's three gifts of nature. Actually, I think I mentioned only two. <laughs> okay. I'm keeping you in suspense. <laughs> what about the third one? <laughs> so, the third one, you can also understand, the third one is the gift of knowledge. Therefore, our dairy industry today is off. It is demoniac. Our modern agricultural practice is off. Is adharmic. It is off. It, it is based on uh, principles that go against dharma. And our educational system around the world is also off. Adharmic. And therefore, we have a lot of work to do. We have to reestablish, not only introduce the Holy Name, but we have to reestablish what is the proper uh, system of governance which is meant to be there. That is the sign of the Kshatriyas. Uh, it is called Dandaniti. The science of politics. Krishna is the greatest politician. Politics is not, well, in Kali Yuga it's a bad word. <laughs> in the same way that Varnasham is also a bad word because it's been misused. Uh, shudra is a bad word, but actually, you know, to be a Shudra, one needs eight specific qualities mentioned by Narada Muni. It is not easy to be a Shudra. Shudra position in society when properly understood, is a very elevated position. 
my God. <laughs> if Shudra is an elevated position, what to speak of Vaishyas, Kshatriyas, and Brahmanas? Yes. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada wanted us to reintroduce Brahminical culture, Kshatriya culture, Vaisha culture, and Shudra culture. It's all culture. I'm sure you've read, or should have read, in the Bhagavatam, or in lectures given by Srila Prabhupada, one is not considered a human being. One is not a human being if one is not within the system of Varnashram. Not a human being. One is not a human being if one is not practicing dharma. Because dharma is what differentiates us from animals. Animals, their only consciousness, as we know, is on the body platform. Eating, sleeping, mating, defending. And when our consciousness is also on that platform, it means lower consciousness, animal consciousness. People don't like to hear that. Huh. Prabhupada would say, it's not me, it's not, you know, it's, it's there in the Shastra. Huh. Krishna's telling. So, <clears throat> we have this tremendous uh, task and responsibility to assist Srila Prabhupada, to assist our previous Acharyas. And we have one book here, actually, that we came out in our ministry. Uh, I put together last year. This is in connection with a doctoral research that I'm uh, undertaking right now with Osmai University on Vedic sociology. And the title of the book is Modernity is Killing Civilization. Prabhupada used this term on a number of occasions. We are not understanding how this whole deviation that is ongoing and that we are allowing in different ways. How is it we're allowing? We continue to use, for example, commercial milk. You know that this year in Mayapur, the GBC passed a resolution that within two years, no ISKCON temple can offer commercial milk on the altar. Within two years, every single temple in ISKCON has to offer a himsa milk. A himsa milk means milk from protected cows, and we need to understand what protected cows are. We should be offering what is best to Krishna. We should, off, we should want to offer what is the purest to Krishna. Uh, we have the highest knowledge, Raja Vidya, Raja Guyam, Pavitram, Idam, Uttamam. Highest knowledge, purest knowledge. So, we should be offering what is best to Krishna. Most of us, every day, what we eat, we don't know where it comes from. And a lot of what we are eating is not good for us. Practically speaking, all the food, all the commercial food, not only the food that we eat, but also even the cloth that we are wearing, most of us, is harmful to us. It's not natural cloth. It's synthetic. So uh, we have a book table somewhere. I think in the back, yeah. We have a few books, actually. Uh, these are more recent books. This one is called Save Our Cows, Save Our Villages, and Save Our Culture. And they're, again, directly connected with these three gifts of nature. We also have this uh, app. It's called Sri Surabi app. You can download this app. And wherever I go and I give a presentation like this, I tell that the first Prabhu and the first Mataji who download the app register and show me, I'll give them a compliment, complimentary book. Little incentive here. <laughs> so uh, there's all kinds of nice information here. This uh, We came out with this about a year ago. And uh, <clears throat> all of the uh, Deshi cows, um, pictures are there. I mean, you can be carrying, you know, especially like in Bangalore or in any big city, it's like rare to get darshan of cows. But actually having even darshan of cow once a day is most auspicious. 
you can have not only darshan of cows, but within the app, we'll play it in a few minutes, there's what is called the Sur- Surabhi Mantra. The Surabhi Mantra is what we chanted a little earlier, Om Sri Surabhyaya Namaha. It's a very nice mantra that our uh, devotees in Bali, uh, they, um, <clears throat> they're practically like, anyway, they came out with a few recordings and uh, I requested them to put that together a few years back. We also number, have a number of pamphlets. We have this, actually, are some of our devotees here? Is there something happening? Huh? Oh, just now arranging the book table. This, uh, okay, anyways. I wanted to show a video, but I think the time is not allowing. Uh, <clears throat> we have a, a wonderful, one of our main uh, projects is called Om Sri Surabhi Campaign. We have a 15 mi- minute video, but I think, I mean, uh, I don't want to uphold things here. Uh, <clears throat> you, you can see this, this video, or this documentary on our, on our website. It's there available. And we have a, a number of pamphlets that also give more information about uh, the ministry's activities. We have a few devotees. Uh, I don't know if they are close by. 